the world most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Henry Hazlitt, editor of The Freeman and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of The American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is General Kenneth C. Royal, former United States Secretary of War. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. General Royal, you were uh, Secretary of War in 1947 when the unification program was under discussion. I was wondering what you thought of that program now in the light of the experience, uh, what its shortcomings were and, or what its achievements were. Well, as long as I remained in the defense establishment, I was convinced that uh, unification neither saved money nor promoted efficiency. And I'm still of that impression, but we can't reverse it. We've got just to try to improve it, and I believe it is being improved. Do you believe that we could improve it by having uh, a greater degree of unification, sir? I do. I think uh, a more complete unification, a single department in every sense, would be the answer. Well, I'd like to ask what you think about our spending in general now. I mean, not only on the Defense Department, but our overall spending. Do you think that there is a real probability uh, within the next year or two of a war with Russia? No, I don't think so. I don't think war is imminent in any sense. That's my impression. Well, do you think in view of that, that our general spending level is too high for the present? Well, it's, it may not be too high if we look at defense alone. But if we look at defense in light of the nation and national economy, I do have a feeling that it is too high. You are a Democrat, of course, sir, and I believe you campaigned strenuously for President Truman in 1948. Now, as an American citizen and a thoughtful one, are you concerned about the fact that our government is, seems to be getting bigger and bigger each year? I am, sir. I'm, just, I'm uh, worried about the financial aspects, and I'm worried about the administrative aspects and the uh, chaperonage of the people. What do you think can be done, uh, General Royal, to uh, cut expenditures? Have you any particular ideas in mind on that line? If, if you mean, uh, can I specify certain expenditures that I think might be eliminated, well, I, I don't believe I am qualified to give you that answer. But I do feel, in general, that Congress should exercise its constitutional duty of supervising expenditure more closely and more accurately than they do today. Well, how could they do that? Would they have to have more uh, help for the committees, more perm larger permanent staff or investigators, or what, what would you have in mind? I think it's probably a detail whether the committee had it or some other agency provided it, but I do think they need considerably more information. As it is now, uh, a department uh, may know all the facts, but it's utterly impossible for a congressional committee under the present circumstances to know whether a request is sound or not. In your concern, sir, over our governments getting bigger and bigger, do you see certain danger signals developing? Uh, for instance, are you concerned over uh, savings in the country or life insurance policies and their value? I'm very much concerned. I think one of the essences of the capitalistic system is the desire to earn and save and acquire property. And if you find that the savings are being reduced in actual value, you are, you are seeing the first signs of a very real danger from inflation and excessive expenditure. You think the, the government spending is one of the main causes I of this? I think it is. I think it's one of the prime the causes of it. 
And specifically, sir, uh, you're concerned about uh, thrift in, in, in our country, and you think, of course, that it must be encouraged, and you see signs that it's being discouraged. That is correct, sir. And, uh, and specifically, uh, one, you see that uh, life insurance uh, policies are losing some of their value. Uh, other forms of savings, securities, uh, even government securities are, are being depreciated, are they not? In their actual purchasing power, yes. Uh, well, a good example of that was uh, war bonds sold in the Second War, isn't it? That's the right. The people who bought war bonds in 1941 expected to make money off of them. As a matter of fact, they didn't get back what they invested, did they? Probably not quite. I'd like to ask you a question a little bit off of this, uh, General. Uh, in view of your experience uh, as Secretary of War, and uh, I'd like to ask how you feel as a citizen. Do you believe in universal military training? I never believed in it. I believe in the draft when you need it for national defense or for national preparedness. But I think universal military training goes directly against the fundamental principles of American freedom. And while you were in the government, sir, did you express your opposition to universal military training? At all times. Now, uh, you've had, uh, you're a southerner, of course, and you've had a great deal of experience with the top brass of our country. And you must have uh, reached some conclusions about our professional military. Now, do you think that we have the most capable professional military in the world, sir? I do. I think American military leaders are the greatest the world has ever produced, and that they deserve a very large part of the credit for winning World War II. Uh, do you think that they are, there is any potential danger in the professional military mind? Specifically, uh, do you think that we should look for presidents uh, as a rule among professional military men? Well, you said as a rule, I believe. Yes, sir. As a rule, no. I think uh, the average uh, military man is adept and capable in his own work, but that he cannot, consistent with his military training, acquire the broad point of view that is necessary for a good president. But now you have implied uh, <coughs> certainly an important exception to that, sir. I intentionally and, did. And, and what is that exception? Well, I, I think uh, everyone can guess the exception is General Eisenhower. Well, do you think General Eisenhower will be the uh, nominee of the Democrats or of the Republicans? Well, I should certainly hope that he'd be the Democratic nominee, but I'm afraid that if he agrees to run at all, it'll be on the Republican ticket. Uh, do, you, you, do you believe that uh, President Truman uh, will be the candidate of, uh, at all? Do you think there's a chance well, of I have that? absolutely no information either as to the plans of President Truman or the plans of General Eisenhower. None whatsoever. But uh, my guess would be that the question of whether President Truman would run or not will depend largely upon whom the opponent would be. Well, now, uh, do you think if the opponent were Senator Taft that uh, he would want to run? I would think so. Now, so how about, how about Warren? Would you feel the same way, or, or, or do you have any ideas of what he would I really uh, have not analyzed that. I don't know just how uh, Warren would uh, Mr. Governor Warren would be evaluated. You are a southerner, sir, as I mentioned a moment ago, although I believe you operate in New York now, up here in this alien country. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like your opinions on uh, what you think the South may do in 1952. Senator Smathers last week uh, said on this show that he doubted that the South would vote for Truman in 1952. Do you share that view? Well, as what they call a Wall Street lawyer, I'm not really entitled to express an opinion on it at this, at this time. But my, I do believe that uh, if Eisenhower were a candidate, that a uh, considerable number of the southern states would vote for him. I'd be doubtful about North Carolina. It gave Truman the fourth biggest majority in the country last time. That might be reduced, but I'm not sure it'd be overcome. Now, from what you've said, sir, about your concerns as, a, as an American citizen, what do you think should be the principal issue in the next campaign? Well, I think there are, there are two issues uh, in general. One is whether uh, the foreign policy, the general foreign policy, is sound, and the other is whether our economy is being adequately taken care of. 
Now, on the, on the question of foreign policy, are you one of the uh, administration's critics on foreign policy, or have you generally favored uh, the foreign policy of the present administration? Well, I've been critical of some aspects of it, but I think the general approach of the administration uh, has been sound. That is, that we must uh, do something to build up uh, Europe and the friendly nations, and that we must help them in providing a defense. Sometime in 1949, I think, a considerable to-do was kicked up by a remark that you were alleged to have made about Japan. I'd like to ask you now whether you believe that Japan would be a good ally in a war against uh, Russia, or whether if uh, Russia uh, were to make a war, whether we would be able to defend Japan. It was my view then, and it is now, that the chances are Japan would be a good ally. You are, uh, you are in the government in 1947. Uh, uh, is it your, were you, did you support our Asiatic policy at that time, sir? Well, in 1947, uh, I was there also until 1949. I think uh, you'd have to define the Asiatic policy more clearly. What about I the was Chinese in Reds? Uh, well, that never came in under our department. We never had any uh, authority or responsibility as to China. I, th I thought our policy toward Japan was an excellent one. I see, sir. Well, as I understand what you've said tonight, sir, to our chronoscope audience, you're an American who's deeply concerned with some of the things that are happening in the country, such as a getting away from thrift, and that you think that General Eisenhower has an excellent chance of being the next president. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was General Kenneth C. Royal, former United States Secretary of War. Apropos of your Christmas gift problem, you may have heard us make the statement that the experience which Longines watchmakers have gained in the production of complicated and technical watches of the highest character has contributed to the betterment of Longines watches of all types. Now, here are some of these Longines technical watches. Each one was created in the Longines laboratory by Longines engineers. It's made in its entirety in the Longines watch factory. It's an exclusive Longines creation. These watches are of vital importance to aviators, sports timers, navigators, astronomers, explorers, and many others. And quite naturally, the exacting watch buyers who use these Longines technical watches choose for their personal use Longines watches like these beautiful examples of the watchmaker's art, which are now being shown by your Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agency. Honored for accuracy in fields of precise timing, Honored for excellence and elegance by 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes and 28 Gold Medal Awards, truly no other name on a Christmas watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. The Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, agency for Longines Whitnor watches. This is Frank Knight speaking.